for joining us here to talk about the growth paradigm for emerging markets. Uh, as you've probably heard uh, over the last few days here at Davos, there is a renewed confidence in the global recovery that we're seeing today, uh, whether it's the IMF's growth forecast for global growth, which uh, looks better for 2018 and 2019. And it also does give us an indication that things are recovering and momentum is picking up in emerging markets as well. Each emerging market does, of course, have its own individual specific problems Problems, but there are several common issues that they need to grapple with. Among them, the path to fiscal consolidation. What do you do with employment? What do you do with the skilling issue? How do you adapt and brace yourselves for Industry 4.0? What do you do about uh, the cost arbitrage advantage that perhaps is, is going to change as we move forward? I think these are some of the issues that policymakers as well as corporate citizens in emerging markets are going to have to grapple with. I've got with me here uh, an eminent set of panelists. So let me start by introducing them to you. Joining us today is uh, Mehmet Semsik, the Deputy Prime Minister of Turkey. Appreciate you joining us on the program. <laughs> Malusi Gigaba, Minister of Finance from South Africa. Thank you very much for joining us. Maxim Orishkin, Minister of Economic Development of the Russian Federation. Appreciate your time here on the program. Dr. Ngozi Onkojivala, Chairman of Gavi, and also with us here today, Justin Lin, the Honorary Dean, the National School of Development, People's Republic of China. Appreciate your time here today. And we do have our Brazilian minister joining us here this evening also. Welcome to the program. Uh, Mr. Semtek, if I can start by asking you about your basic outlook for growth at this point in time. Turkey is one of the emerging markets that has seen a growth in, uh, uh, in the economy. Uh, but you also believe that reforms are going to be vital for the momentum to continue. A, what's the outlook? B, the key reforms that you wish to undertake? Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here, ladies and gentlemen. Turkey has been a leading growth story of the past 15 years. Uh, growth has averaged to about 5.7%. Post-global financial crisis, we've actually done better. It's about 6.7%, and for almost last century, it averaged to about 4.8%. So we have, you know, strong growth. What makes me positive about the outlook in the long run, beyond this year and mm -hmm. next, is that we have extremely favorable demographics. Um, in Turkey, we are creating jobs, 8.4 million jobs, post-global financial crisis, this is very strong. Labor participation rate is rising. Working age population is rising by about 2%. So demographics supports growth. Secondly, productivity. My government has prioritized infrastructure, mm -hmm. investment in education, human capital stock, and R&D innovation ecosystem. We're making progress across the board. I think productivity has also been rising reasonably strong. We're still below OECD average in terms of, uh, but that is supportive of growth. The final point is quality of institutions. Um, there's a big debate about Turkey's recent experience, but you know we are only responding to geopolitical drags mm. and, and domestic shocks. Turkey is committed to enhancing rule of law, standards of democracy, and building quality institutions. And we remain an accession candidate, even though the end game is far from having been decided. So I think the outlook based on these three key long-term factors is positive. Reform-wise, uh, clearly, we need to continue to invest in human mm -hmm. and the quality of education matters. Access to education has gone through the roof. Schools are free from preschool all the way to PhD, no tuition fees, scholarship for almost everybody. So we spend 23% of tax revenues on education. So that's one top priority. Labor market flexibility to enhance, you know, clearly uh, prospects of jobs, skills, active labor market policies, yeah. that's another key area. Mm -hmm. Uh, another area, investment climate, we need to attract FDI. There's a lot of competition. And, uh, you know, clearly this is one area where we use World Bank ease of doing business as kind of like guidebook, and we're going to continue to focus on that. Um, another area, 
to speed up justice and quality of judicial system. Mm -hmm. That's another key area. So I can go on and on, but uh, there are really strong, there is strong focus on reforms. Uh, a lot of, you know, what has happened in our region got in the way, but uh, we're going to back, going to back Is to... politics still the number one risk to growth? Politics um, has not prevented <laughs> Turkey from growing. <coughs> Geopolitics has been a drag. I mean, Turkey today is the world's largest refugee hosting country. We've spent $34 billion on three and a half million Syrian refugees since 2011. I mean, it's, it's, it's reality. But we have to deal with it because we have 911 kilometers of border with Syria. And power vacuum means also terror and, and, and risk, high risk premium. Mm. So this has, but despite all this, Turkey has been able to grow. Last year, most likely growth rate, we don't have the fourth quarter, was over 7% mm. in real terms, creating 1.3 million jobs in a single year. To keep things in a context, entire EU 28 members last year created 1.9 million jobs. So Turkey has the momentum. Our vulnerability is not politics. It's actually low savings. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we have investment rates of about 29, 30%, but savings rates of about 24, 25%. That means sizable current account deficit. You know, we are at the mercy to some extent, right. the global risk appetite. And sure. that's why we are taking further reforms. I don't want to take more time, but the latest reform we did, which came on board today, we essentially barring SMEs from borrowing in hard currency unless they are exporters, with some exceptions. Okay. And the large companies, we're gonna require them to hedge or have a natural hedge. So basically to contain exchange rate volatility the way India, Indonesia have done it, so we're not reinventing the wheel. We've done a, an important reform, which is a macro prudential step because lira weakness has been key to high inflation Sure. And uh, we want to contain it. And I think inflation control is something that everybody on this panel is, uh, is going to be uh, uh, focusing on. But let me come to you, Mr. Rishkin, and talk about the outlook for Russia. You've just presented your outlook for 2020. You want to reduce your dependence on volatility of oil prices. You intend to invest significantly in technology. Uh, your growth outlook is what? Between 2.1 and about 2.3 percent between 2018 and 2020. How do you intend to get there? Well, it's actually a base case. Uh, in the uh, optimistic case, which we are targeting, we are targeting the growth of three and three and a half percent for the forthcoming years. The story for Russia is that we were adjusting in the past couple of years to lower oil prices. We did it. We returned back to growth. We have inflation of 2.3 percent. This year, we will have a fiscal surplus of more than 1% of GDP. Mm. And what is more important that we have implemented a number of structural macroeconomic reforms, and we completed this. And this set of reforms, these new institutes, will be defending the domestic economy from the volatility of oil prices. So for Russia, these days, oil prices not uh, matter that much like it was five, seven years ago. What is also important is that Russia, in the different stage of debt cycle and economic cycle, comparing with, with, with most of the emerging markets, on average, emerging markets these days is, are having debt of 190% of mm -hmm. GDP. Russia, it's only 80. So we are in the beginning of the uh, long-standing credit cycle and long-standing economic cycle. And uh, we will be trying to do our best in order to make this growth cycle stronger. I want to pick up on one specific issue, and that is the unemployment rate. Because according to your own projections, between 2017 and 2019, you expect unemployment rates of between 5.2% and 4.9%. Uh, how much? Uh, of this is a concern and a worry for you, and how do you intend to address it? Well, uh, demography is one of the key challenges for Russia. Uh, in the forthcoming years, we will be experiencing decline in working age population. So that is why, for example, digitalization and technology is one of the uh, you know uh, answers to those problems that we have. You know, a lot of people speak about automation, artificial intelligence, and that that. that uh, this can be a problem in terms of the job market. For Russia, it's actually a solution to the problems that we have on the demography side. Mm -hmm. All right, let me come to South Africa then, and let me ask you, sir, uh, some of the challenges that you face, uh, I think some uh, are challenges that we face in India as well, dealing with 
uh, unlocking value as far as state-owned companies are concerned, for instance. Fiscal consolidation is an issue that you're grappling with as well. Uh, unemployment, as we just heard there from Russia, is a challenge that you're faced with as well. What is the outlook for 2018 and what is the reform agenda? You know, we, we have gone through several years of economic slowdown. And in, 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 at first, it was as a result of the global slowdown, but we've seen the curve um, turning in terms of the global economic outlook. Um, even for sub-Saharan Africa, we expect stronger growth, but South Africa trails behind the, that growth curve. As a result, in large measure of um, systemic and, and, and subjective um, structural factors in the economy that we need to deal with. A lot of the reasons why our economy is growing slowly, it's not creating employment, is because of um, subjective factors that are within the control of government. And mm -hmm. all we need to do is to take the hard decisions, and that includes a number of structural factors, the, the uh, resolving uh, outstanding sector policies, around mining, telecommunications, and, uh, uh, energy, resolving the governance of state-owned companies and strengthening the financial sustainability of our state-owned companies, ensuring that they have proper management and they are run properly, um, and, and, and addressing the problems of unemployment mm -hmm. and, and, and labor market reforms, which require that we forge stronger partnerships between government, the private sector, and, and labor, but, but also ensuring that um, we, we, we respond to our challenges by providing political certainty. So in, in our country, we've had a, a number of these challenges. So for this year, um, much as the, the, the IMF has revised our growth projections downwards to 0 0.9, we, we think that we, we can because of the political certainty that has now been provided and, and a number of other positive factors in our economy, a promise that we can um, uh, resolve the sectoral challenges and, you, uh, and, and boost business confidence. We, we think that we can um, surprise ourselves to the upside and get the economy going um, stronger than what, what, what has been the case. So my thought is that the 0.9% the growth projection by the IMF is only if things remain the same and we do nothing more. Okay. And so I think if we, we, we are going to do something, there's been a positive sentiment even here among investors. If we sustain that momentum of confidence, uh, because confidence building business and consumer confidence is the cheapest form of stimulus, they say. <laughs> we intend to do exactly the same thing and fight corruption, create a positive perception about public institutions in the country, and we think that would uh, turn the economy around and get us going. Well, you're not the only one who thinks that the IMF growth forecast for your country is, uh, is not accurate. Uh, uh, Brazil, sir, you, you feel exactly the same way. You believe that the IMF is wrong in its forecast of 1.5% uh, growth for Brazil. You believe that it's likely to be upwards of 3%, and you believe that is on account of things like pension reforms that you've been able to take. And you even think that the elections, in fact, uh, are a stimulus for, for growth. Why is that? Well, let's uh, go by part. First, uh, indeed, uh, I think that the projections for the GDP growth for 2017 are being revised up uh, by uh, the analysts in general and by the agencies and by ourselves. Uh, and the reason for that is that the economy is recovering uh, faster and in a stronger path than it was forecasted before. You might recall we, we have uh, faced and come out of the worst recession ever in mm. Brazil. Uh, we faced a contraction of 8% of the GDP in uh, two years and, and, and one quarter. And now it's a very strong recovery, but coming from a minus, uh, minus 3.6 yes. in 2016 to plus uh, 1 in 2017, which is our forecast, is a very strong and steep path of recovery. And that is continuing in 2018. Then, definitely, uh, we are getting into, uh, into this year with a strong momentum. Uh, social security reform, indeed, is very important. 
for the consolidation of the fiscal uh, path during the next years. It's a, 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 a challenge, obviously, as in any country, to reform the pension uh, system. But uh, uh, I, I, I am confident that this is going to be approved. It's going to be voted now in, in February. Mm. And uh, that's an important element. Regarding elections, obviously, uh, that's a question to be seen. But my point is that with all the bad experience Brazilians had mm. during the last uh, years, with, uh, let's call, uh, alternative uh, macroeconomic policies, and now with the kind of reforms and fiscal consolidation, etc., the, the country uh, growing again and jobs being created, 1.4 million new jobs created in 17, expectation of 2.5 million new jobs in 18, we uh, think, I personally have this opinion, that all of that paves the way for a decision made by the voters of uh, continuing uh, a path which is leading to growth and has shown that during the past. Okay, I I'll come to the, some of the specific issues that each of you have raised, but let me come to uh, you, Justin Lin. Uh, you know, there is confidence that's emerging here on this panel of emerging markets. Uh, if I look at what the, the IMF or the World Bank are saying, uh, that the risks at this point in time to growth seem pretty balanced, uh, what would you believe could sort of <coughs> aid the recovery or what could be a deterrent to the momentum continuing? Well, let me answer your question in a long historical context. Because this year, China is celebrating the 40th anniversary a transition from a planned economy mm. to a market economy. And as you know, the growth in these 40 years is a miracle in human history. On the average, the growth rate was 9.5% per year yeah. for 40 years. But certainly, China now is an upper middle income country. Mm -hmm. And a growth rate moderated somewhat but only some fat. Mm -hmm. Because last year, the government's growth target was 6.5%. Yes. But the growth rate last year was 6.9%. Certainly, we do not expect China to go back to 9.5, 10 percent mm -hmm. growth. But I'm very confident this year, the growth will be between 6.5% to 7%. OK. Whether China will be close to 7% very much depends on external hmm. you know, economic situation. But even you know, if the growth in you know, high-income countries sustain and so on, I'm very confident the growth will be close to 7%. Hmm. But even there's something unexpected, I think China will have the potential and likelihood to have a growth rate of 6.5% at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we come in you know, to look forward, I think you know, come in five years or more, very likely China will be able to maintain 6% growth rate. And uh, the reason I have this confidence is because first, China is an upper middle income country. Yes. And so the growth potential is still very large. Secondly, China has an enviable saving rate. Mm. You know, our saving rate is more than 40% of GDP, mm. among the highest. <laughs> At the same time, we have a very high employment rate. Mm. And as a result, household income increased faster than the GDP growth rate. And that translates to high consumption growth rate. Right. So with that, certainly, I think, no matter what kind of external situation, mm -hmm. China will be able to maintain 6% in a growth in the coming years. Certainly, the challenge in China is not growth itself. The challenge in China is how to sustain the growth 
with higher quality of growth. Mm. And for that, China will have to continue the reform because, as you know, China did not adopt structure up here to remove all the distortion at the beginning of this transition. China adopted some kind of very pragmatic dual yeah. track mm. in a gradual reform strategy. And so in our economy, there are still many distortions, interventions. For that, China need to deepen in the reform. But at the same time, China also need to address the issue of income inequality. Yes. In order to you know, make every people, every person in China can be happy with the growth we have. Fair point. And the third one is that with the income not increasing, people will demand higher standards mm. on many things, you know, like environment, green growth, public service, and so on. And I think that growth rate is not an issue, but how to really sustain this growth and with higher quality yes. growth will be the challenges. And that is actually the you know, program that has been announced by President Xi Jinping right. at the party congress. Yes. And so maybe we can expect China to have high growth with high quality also. High quality growth is what the aspiration is in China. But I want to pick up from, from where we left off as we're talking about China. And if I can come to you, Konjo uh, you know, And Justin Lin, you were, uh, your comments on a report that I read, which Deloitte has put out, uh, which expects a demand shock for emerging markets in a good way. And that's because you believe that uh, uh, China could lose up to 85 million jobs within the next decade due to rising production costs. So while that could be a challenge for China, could it be an opportunity for other emerging markets, Okonjo? Let yeah, me respond first. Okay. okay, all right. Since it was your comment, I'll get you well, to respond first. It's a challenge, but it's a necessity. If China wants to retain those 85 million labor intensive, low value added job in China, then the growth target in China will not be achieved, mm. right? So if want China wanted to have a high income continuously, China needs to upgrade the industry continuously. And to new sector which you know, emerge as a new competitive yeah. advantage of China. All the sectors used to be the competitive advantage of China. <coughs> they will have to be you know, relocated mm -hmm. to other countries, yes. voluntarily or involuntarily. Yeah. That is a process of economic development. And certainly my sister will be very happy to answer <laughs> the, rest, the second half of the question. So the shift in production that we just discussed here, what, what kind of an opportunity does it throw up for other emerging markets? Well, I think it throws up a significant opportunity, uh, especially for, I think, the African countries um, should try to seize this opportunity. But of course, they'll have to compete with uh, other uh, poorer <coughs> East Asian countries mm -hmm. like Cambodia and so on, Vietnam. Uh, North Africa, but I think it's a, it's a significant opportunity and we're seeing some of that coming through, through in Ethiopia, uh, where China has made a conscious effort uh, to set up industrial parks, uh, to shift some of the production of textiles and shoe and leather um, uh, to Ethiopia. And I think it's working from an investment of about $200 million mm. in it's now going to be tenfold, about two billion. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also investing in, infra in infrastructure. But for us, let's say on the continent, emerging markets on the continent, and any emerging markets to seize this opportunity, um, we have to do two or three things. Yeah. I think one is infrastructure um, mm. um, deficit, mm -hmm. particularly in, in Africa, in some of our countries, without um, adequate power. Yes ports and railroads we will not be able to seize that opportunity because we've got to be able to, to provide the, the basic wherewithal uh, to make the manufacturing work. Um, we also need in, uh, to look at uh, doing business indicators, you mm. know, the bureaucracy and red, red tape um, uh, of some of our policies that prevent us from taking advantage. And I believe that uh, some, several countries on the continent have done better on the doing business, Minister Shimshek spoke about that for Turkey. Several African countries have improved uh, on that, including my own country, Nigeria. And we have to do structural reforms mm. 
you know, that will enable us to, to, to be able to sustain and provide the environment? But the answer is yes. And if we don't move, well, every country will take advantage, those that can. Uh, Minister Meryl, let me come to you now, uh, because, uh, you know, when we're talking about competitive advantage and when we're talking about emerging markets utilizing the opportunity uh, that they have at this point in time to, uh, to, to nurture the growth that you're seeing or the recovery that you're currently seeing. Brazil, for instance, uh, it's seen as a closed economy. Uh, you do have high import tariffs, uh, protectionist measures. As you now look uh, at trying to be a much larger player in the global landscape. What is it going to take in terms of key structural reforms, in terms of being able to attract foreign direct investment, in terms of being able to reduce tariff barriers? What is it going to take to make you more competitive? Uh, yes, you are right in the sense that Brazil has grown throughout the last decades based on our, our model of developing the domestic market, uh, increasing the market, uh, for instance, to give an idea, only uh, from 2003 until 2014, 63 million Brazilians joined the middle class, for instance, of a population of about 200. That means that, indeed, this model has worked for a time. Yeah. Uh, so and it's not relevant the, any longer. Yeah, the, exactly. The, now... The next challenge is to open up the economy, and this is exactly what we are doing now. The question that you pose then is, OK, you open up, but how do you become competitive moving from a uh, domestic-based consumption model to uh, export competition? The idea here is to make, and we are already doing that, a series of structural reforms mm in order to boost competitiveness. For instance, it was already approved a very comprehensive labor reform. Okay. Simplifying the whole, the whole system, lowering the cost, making the whole system more compet competitive. For instance, uh, changing the credit market, reforming the credit market, offering credit, more credit available, etc. Have investments into infrastructure, privatization, bringing private capital to infrastructure mm. uh, investment, also that boosts uh, productivity. Cutting red tape throughout the country, investing more in technology, in investment, in research. And all of that together is a series of reforms that we call the microeconomic reforms, which means productivity enhancing reforms. But does it worry you that you've decided to open up at a time when it looks like the world is moving towards closing their doors and windows, Absolutely. or at least seems so at this point in time? Absolutely. But still, the difference uh, was so large that we still have room, <laughs> you have room. To, to get together. Uh, let me ask you, you talked about foreign direct investment and, and the plan there for Turkey to be able to attract foreign direct investment. In terms of structural reforms, what is it that you intend to focus on to ensure that that is in fact a reality? Well, um, in terms of attracting FDI, clearly the market size is there. I mean, Turkey now, including refugees, you're talking about 85 million population per capita GDP at the current exchange rate, which has imploded in recent years on the back of political risk premia, uh, is still over, well over $10,000. On a PPP basis, about $26,000, $27,000. So it is a sizable market, and it's a growing market. So that, on its own, is attractive. But to make it more attractive, I think we should continue to invest and, and do the way our Brazilian friends are doing, you know, growth enhancing, productivity enhancing reforms, because it's all about prospects of growth. Mm. And prospects of growth are strong. The reforms that we are talking about, clearly a better investment climate would, would help, because as I said, there is a lot of competition. But also sometimes, you know, a targeted incentives would help. We do have a tailor-made incentive regime that is aimed at reducing Turkey's reliance on imports, dependency on imports. So companies that do come to Turkey to invest, we do you know, support them strongly, you know, huge tax breaks or other supports, if they're going to either reduce you know, imports or 
expand our export capacity. Mm. Uh, it's a very transparent, competitive way. It's open to everybody. So it's not a protectionist, uh, you know, attitude or, or, or framework. Uh, so certainly that, that also probably will help going forward. What would also help, of course, is a break for our part of the world. I mean, of course, our Brazilian friends are lucky or our even, you know, South African and, and Chinese friends, we, they, they, they're not neighbors to... Uh, countries that are no longer functioning states, you know, such as Syria, clearly that's an issue. But despite that, I think the prospects are strong. Mm. We're going to continue to attract decent level of FDI. You know, a lot of the conversation around uh, emerging markets is the manufacturing opportunity, and every government uh, is is putting out programs and policies to encourage manufacturing, including uh, the government in India that aspires uh, for the share of to be about 25% of GDP. But how realistic is that and how relevant is that for the times that we live in today? Uh, and Mr. Oshkin, let me ask you this because I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put forward to you uh, findings of an A.T. Carney report which talks about the future of production. Uh, so 25% of the countries that account for over 75% of global manufacturing are well positioned to increase their share in the future and a country like Russia doesn't figure in that. So then does manufacturing become the priority for you or do you intend then to focus more on services and what kind of a challenge does that throw up? Well, <coughs> Russian economy is the economy with per capita GDP which is well above the global average. It's well developed economy, so the share of manufacturing in, within uh, Russia's GDP is only 12%. Yeah. Of course, this is one of the priorities here, but we clearly understand that only by using manufacturing, uh, manufacturing we will not achieve strong growth rates because of the small share it's of it in GDP. But what is important is that manufacturing is one of the core industries, which mm. create a lot of industries around it, create the services sector. So creating such core industries, creating competition in uh, you know aircraft making, other other stories where we. So will you focus on high end manufacturing? Of course, of course. Okay. Yeah. And and that's that's the way. And what about the services sector? Because do you feel that? For Russia today, that would be more relevant in terms of a growth driver? Yes, and one of the priorities for the coming years is a substantial increase in the quality of life for the Russian population. And it also means that a lot of small and medium-sized businesses should grow around this trend, improving Russian cities, improving how the SMEs are performing in those mm. cities. So this will be one of the gro main growth trends for the forthcoming years and supporting the higher GDP figures. You know, we just heard uh, that... I'll, I'll just come to you, Mr. Lin, in, in, in a second. But in South Africa, how much of, of the focus uh, from a government perspective is on education, investing in education skills? Because that is what is going to be relevant as you look at being part of the global economy as we move towards more disruptive technologies and uh, if you do aspire to, to get a share of the manufacturing pie. We, we are one of the countries that are spending a lot of... Um, that are investing a lot on, on education in South Africa. We, we, we have, over the last few years, invested a lot on, on, on uh, elementary education, pre-primary education, primary education, right up to um, the commitment we've recently made uh, to, towards um, higher education to expand access. A lot of our universities have opened up spaces for uh, students, especially from poor and, and working class backgrounds. And we've invested a lot of money in mm. technical and vocational training and education. The challenge remains the throughput. Um, the, the challenge remains um, ensuring that the outcomes at the end match the investment done at the end. But at a more qualitative level, the challenge remains um, ensuring that the quality of the skills that are produced yeah. at the end of the process matches the modern economy and the direction towards which mm. the global economy is moving, as well as the South African economy itself. So we, we are paying a great deal of attention to, to upgrading our education system, focusing on its transformation, ensuring that we can meet the challenges of the new economy. Mm. Um, and, and, and for us to achieve that, we, we need not only the government um, to, to, to focus on formulating the policies, we need to partner with the private sector, learn from international best practice, how other countries are, are managing this challenge, and ensure that the discussions that are 
based around artificial intelligence, digitalization, yeah. um, and, and other such issues. Filter. Is, not that, only... is that a priority for your government? Disruptive technologies and how do you actually cope with the, the impact of disruptive technologies, whether it's AI or 3D or printing and so on and so forth? How much of that consumes your political bandwidth? Well, it is a priority now because the, the, the 54th National Conference of the Ruling Party directed us to establish a commission or on, on the fourth industrial revolution and, and digitalization. And, and so it's an area we're going to pay a great deal of attention to. We know that we don't have much time to catch up. Mm. We know that there are significant challenges facing our economy in that it's still very much predicated on, on primary production, on the, on the minerals energy complex, and sure. we need to shift it towards not only manufacturing, but catching up with them. Um, the digitalization uh, technologies which are coming up in other countries. So our education system must, must catch up. We need to, we, we still need to achieve a 1% investment in research and development. And, and, and so there's a lot of work mm. that we need to do. But South Africa is not a country that is short of resources. Yeah. We are a country that has not deployed its resources as well as we should in order to achieve the goals that are going to uplift the quality of life of our people and put us on par with other countries. Justin, then you wanted to come in on the point on, on manufacturing and services. Yeah. Right. I'd like to come back to the issue of manufacturing or services as a strategy of development. I think that in the last decades, there was a debate in the global development community and academic circle. At that time, they think, because the opportunity of information services, it's unnecessary to go through manufacturing stage of development. And one good example was India. Mm. Their information services has been one of the major exporting sectors of India. Yes. But I look carefully. They were very successful in information services, but it directly creates two million jobs, mm -hmm. because the income for people in that sectors was much higher, so they consume more. And indirectly, it generated another five million jobs, right. altogether seven million. Yes. China do their own manufacturing. And how many jobs in China employ in the manufacturing sectors? 124 million. Population size, yeah. In China and in India, it's similar. And uh, by manufacturing, China has 124 million jobs. And uh, in the light manufacturing alone, you mentioned 85 million jobs. Mm. So I think that was the reason that India, you know, if you compare China and India in 1978, yes. when China started the transition. India's per capita GDP was 25% higher than China. That's right. Now, India's per capita GDP is only 20% of China. And the main reason, there was not so many jobs to accommodate the arm migration of low-value-added agricultural workers mm. to higher-value-added modern sectors. And I think that was the reason why Modi now say have a program to have make in India yeah. and uh, to go back to the manufacturing. Then the question is that if every country reached the target of 25% mm. of their GDP in manufacturing, manufacturing, are we going to have a large enough global market to accommodate yes. so many products from the industries? Here I'd like to mention the debate in the early 1980s when China started the transition. Because before 1980s, certainly East Asian Dragon, Korea, Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, they were the manufacturing center for land manufacturing goods. And at that time, China started to enter into the land manufacturing. And the people think if China entering into the land manufacturing can well accommodate mm. the you know, production from China, because in the early 1980s, the job in manufacturing sectors in Korea was 2.3 million. Yeah. In Taiwan, China, 
1.5 million, Hong Kong, 1 million, and Singapore, half a million. And I mentioned, you know, China, actually yeah. 124 million, million jobs. Yeah. And so people think a Chinese product, you know, we cannot be accommodated by the global market. But here I'd like to mention, with the manufacturing job, people's income increase. So they not only produce goods for other people. Creates consumer demand They also well. consume yeah. the good and yeah. also for the global market. Yeah. And actually, many people only talk about the export from China. But actually, import from to, to China is almost growing at about the same rate. Mm. So I think that, you know, actually, the debate now has been, you know, over. The debate. I think that manufacturing is important for every country. Yes. And uh, if you have opportunity for service, fine, but you cannot be great manufacturing. And I think that's the reason Modi now promote. Make in, Make in Africa. Make in yeah. India. Make in India. Make in India. No, no, no. Modi is not promoting no, we'll, Make in uh, Africa. We'll <laughs> no, 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 because, because I have been devoted so much time to promote Make in Africa. I think, I think because uh, Justin is really, uh, you know, he's an African at heart and has looked at it. But I just wanted to add to that debate yeah. that, look, I mean, sometimes I think it's a false debate, you know, manufacturing or services. It's both. And I think that every country, every continent, um, you know, that should, should try to create good jobs, sure. good manufacturing yes. jobs. Yes, we have AI, we have automation that is coming down the line. But I think for the next generation, uh, you know, at least until 2030, 2040, there's still uh, this space where we will have to be producing goods, uh, you know, that people will consume. And a lot of it will be done by labor uh, rather than by robots. And in that regard, I think the African continent, uh, you know, it, it should also work very hard. Uh, you know, it has been those countries that had a manufacturing sector have seen deindustrialization. Yeah. It, 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 jobs have been lost. In my country, we had a thriving textile sector. And over the decades of the 80s and 90s, we went from 600,000 jobs to 20,000. Uh, you know, because of competition from China, you know, South Africa lost about 75,000 jobs from ele electronics, electrical. And we are producing many raw materials and consumer goods. Why should we spend $34 billion importing Import, food on the yeah, continent? Yeah. We can, you know, just uh, add more value and create some manufacturing that will also employ our youth and produce good jobs and good income. Yes, Minister. Well, I'll come back to the issue. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to you in just a second, yeah. Justin. Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think that we should uh, look at the basic here. Where evidently, uh, we have to, one, to create jobs. We have to employ the population. Uh, number two, we have to balance the current account. And third, we have to increase the level of income. That, that's about the, the, the basic objectives. And having said that, evidently, uh, industrialization is very important. And, and it's a, a, a serious part of this balance. No one can, uh, in the emerging market with large population, can really balance all of that without a strong industrial production base and so on and so forth. But in having said that, it's also very important to emphasize the role of being competitive in sectors in which you have a competitive advantage. Right, right. Uh, not necessarily only in some kind of manufacturing. For instance, India is a good example with technology, et cetera, et cetera, as it was mentioned. In the case of Brazil, there is a very interesting and important also example, is the use of technology in the agricultural production mm that Brazil, using only 9% of the territory uh, last year, for in instance, had a record uh, production of grains, being one of the first or second larger right. exporter in the globe, again, producing 242 million tons of grains, and all of that with a heavier and heavier use of technology in the agricultural mm. sector, that not only create jobs as well, but also provides a strong boost to exports. Then what I'm saying is, is true. We have to have a strong industrial basis. Uh, uh, we are also 
working on that with productivity measurement, improvements, etc., as we were discussing before. But also, we have to pay attention in what sector that yeah. country, that focus, economy focus can be Focus on your capabilities and leverage your strengths. Yes, exactly. Mr. Simsek. I just want to add one point. I think emerging markets, many of them, of course, excluding China and some others, many of them face premature deindustrialization. So the share of industrial output in GDP, you know, normally for countries in the catching up phase, should remain relatively strong, whether that's 25% or, but should be tw over 20. But for many countries, actually under 20%. Yeah. And that's actually quite a risk considering circumstances. Going forward, we do talk about technology, but technology usually in the sectors I mean, where technology is significant and of course with artificial intelligence, you're gonna get probably less jobs mm. with those type of you know, uh, sectors. It's, it's very clear. <coughs> the other day I saw uh, a social media message. You know, if you go back to like um, top three automotive companies, they generate annually $250 billion of revenue with 1.2 million employees. But top three tech companies yes. that generate $247 billion of revenue only, only does that with 137,000 yeah. employees. So clearly, I agree with my again friend from Brazil, clearly we need to have a, a much broader, mm. a, you know, a comprehensive approach. And, and I think the governments in emerging markets need to have a more interventionist industrial policy in the sense that we need to support you know, we should avoid premature deindustrialization. Sure. That's it's what we're trying to do in Turkey. Uh, Mr. Oshkin, let me come to you now, because one of the other important imperatives for emerging markets is going to be, uh, when you talk about enhancing competitiveness, is linking competitiveness to innovation. And if you look at all the data, the competitive or highly competitive countries today are also the most innovative countries today. You're investing as part of your 2020 plan significantly in technology. That's going to be a big focus area for you. So what is the priority when it comes to enhancing innovation uh, and linking that to your competitive advantage? Well, all the stories that will help us to change the structure of the labor market, because you know that in the demography situation that we have, the less we need to have less jobs which can be automated and we need to have more jobs which will bring more value. And the jobs of higher quality will mean higher wages, will mean higher consumer demand, and it will mean a strong economy. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to shift the conversation a bit um, and, and say this. I mean, we're focusing, everyone is feeling relief now because global growth is back. Mm. Um, you know, developed countries are doing better, emerging markets are doing better, etc. And I'm afraid, you know, we may start losing again the lessons mm. that are coming from this period. Mm. And I want us to talk a little bit about you know, how they share, who shares in this growth? The issue of which emerging markets are succeeding and which are not. McKinsey is just coming out with a new study showing that, you know, emerging markets are expected. They contributed 63% of global growth in the past 15 mm. years. And the projection is that to 2030, they will continue. But the 18 most successful ones are those who managed to grow and share the Absolutely. benefits of growth you know, among workers as yes. well as uh, investors. Among workers, wages doubled. And, you know, uh, the companies also saw profits. Mm. Governments were able to tax better mm. and redistribute. Savings went up. So I think it's not just about growth and innovation, but the quality of the growth Absolutely. has just seen. And the redistributive policies where many countries have been failing. I think that is crucial. And we must keep that at the center of the conversation. You're absolutely right. And Justin, I want you to pick up on that. The idea of inclusion, the idea of improving the quality of growth that you just talked about in your opening comments, uh, you know, and this is a challenge that is going to be faced by most emerging market economies. Uh, how do you move your per capita income up? I mean, India is grappling with that issue at this point in time. Uh, you know, what, what are the imperatives that policymakers will need to focus on as we move forward from an inclusion yeah. perspective? I think that it related a debate in the 1980s, 1990s. At that time, most people think once you have market, everything will happen spontaneously. 
and only good things. However, if you want to have high quality growth, inclusive growth, certainly on the one hand, you should rely on markets, provide incentive for entrepreneur, mm. but at the same time, you also need to have uh, safety net. enabling government to facilitate the growth in a direction that can be inclusive, mm. in a direction that will not only have a quantitative expansion, but also with quality enhancement. And uh, you know, I like go come back to you know the discussion about in the 1980, 1990s, that job lost in the textile government sector in Nigeria. Nigeria and uh, electronic sectors in South Africa and so on. Actually, that related to you know, the development model at that time. At that time, we have a lot of talk about trade liberalization. Mm. It removed the trade barriers, and uh, that it did the market to you know, take yeah. care of everything. Yeah. Yeah. As a result, how can you compete with the Chinese export? Mm. Because as you mentioned, infrastructure was poor. Yeah. Visit environment was not good enough. Education cannot really mm. you know, uh, uh, help the worker to acquire new technology. But fortunately, China in this transition process, on the one hand, allowed the market to play increasingly important role. But the government always play a very proactive facilitation yeah. role. In some format, like you know, the industrial policy the Deputy Prime Minister Turkey you know, mentioned. So I think that. Certainly, there are many challenges in the world. But for me, one of the important challenges is that we need to have a reflection of the model that we use to advocate and to gain some more insight so we can really make the growth inclusive with high quality benefit everyone in the coming year, including the artificial intelligence and so on, those kind of new technology available. Absolutely, yes. Yes, quick comments, I'll, I'll come around and then I'll come to the floor for questions. Yes, go ahead. You know, I, I also want to add another dimension to the discussion on inclusion. Uh, inclusion not with, within countries, but inclusion between countries. I think one of the positive prospects, especially for Southern Africa, uh, or, or, or specifically for South Africa today, is the political transition, the changes taking place in Zimbabwe and in Angola. Because those are, are big economies and, and, and Zimbabwe promises mm. that if the, the transition is followed through successfully and significant structural reforms are implemented and political reforms in, in, the, in that country, yeah it would have a great benefit, not only for the people of Zimbabwe, but for the people of Southern Africa. Mm. And so when we talk about I inclusion, we, we need not focus only yeah. on, on what happens at a country level, mm. but we must also look at how that inclusion is shared and distributed across the regions so that everybody is brought on board. And that would have an impact on, on, on the migration patterns. It's mm. not going to stop them. As anybody who asks me whether migration patterns between South Africa and Zimbabwe are going to stop now because of the changes taking place in Zimbabwe? My answer is simply no. The two countries are, are too closely intertwined for migration patterns to be reversed. But what we need to do is to manage it properly so that, that so the benefits of the changes of the economic development mm. are then shared equitably among More the More coordinated action is, is what you're suggesting. So we saw that happen post the 2008 financial crisis where yes. central bankers moved in a much more coordinated fashion. You're saying that governments, <coughs> when it comes to even things like fiscal policy, et cetera, yes. should move in a much more coordinated fashion. Yes, sir, go ahead. Sorry. Yes, I, uh, I would like to come back to the point of inclusive growth. Uh, Evidently, that is, is critical that uh, we have inclusion, we have income distribution, and we, we increase the national level of income at the same time. And having said that, I think that the, the direction here is one of number uh, of first uh, developing and, 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 and giving incentives to the most productive sectors of the economy in a way that you don't create artificial sectors, artificial mm. industries, subsidized, because yeah. 
that has proven not to to be uh, viable really or survivable or yeah, viable. Yeah, yeah. No, number two, the moment you do that, then you create uh, uh, as balanced as possible growth and creating as many as possible jobs. And having said that, it's also important to complement that with social programs. Mm. For instance, programs which would uh, pay uh, a basic uh, salary for people who are not prepared to get into the formal market, mm. for instance, uh, because lack of education, historical sure. reasons, etc. And then uh, the second step, after that being done and those uh, persons not only joining the consumer market, but being able to send their children to mm. school. And then it's very important to provide also an additional program to support and, and give incentives for all these children who then go to a school, who learn and become more and more part mm. of the production line, etc. And then that, in due time, you increase uh, uh, the national level of income, but also the inclusion element is, is, is present. Yes, Mr. Simsek. I think regarding inclusiveness, at least in our part of the world, but probably for most emerging markets, there are three important aspects. One is women. Labor participation rate in Turkey among females have gone up by 10 percentage points, but we're still well below OECD and EU yeah. averages. So clearly, investment in educating women and providing incentives for higher labor participation and high, higher, you know, strong support for women uh, entrepreneurs is one area where you enhance inclusiveness. The other one is SMEs. Yes. Um, I know our Brazilian friends have done good reforms. Last year, we introduced a major credit guarantee scheme, mm. and it worked really successfully. 203,000 companies benefited. So Treasury stepped in with very low NPLs, very low fiscal cost, and it was very successful. We brought on board access to finance right. for SMEs is absolutely critical. Finally, I think for emerging markets like us, it's clearly important to set up the right mechanisms to support startups, mm. including, you know, uh, literally support for venture capital, for business angels, crowdfunding, sure. investment banks that will be willing to support negative cash flow companies for a while, because you know the, the new economy clearly requires that type of support mechanisms. That would certainly help, again, make you more competitive. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. We're completely out of time, so I'm gonna give everyone 10 seconds, and let me start by asking you, Justin, and what's the one thing that worries you most when you go to bed at night about global growth, the global economy, China? <laughs> well, I think what worries me the most... President Trump. <laughs> <laughs> It's the wrong idea prevail in the world <laughs> and leading us to a wrong direction and a catastrophe results. The one, I, one thing that keeps you up at night. Failure to sustain the momentum of growth. If the leadership of emerging markets, if the world leadership fails, if, the, if we drop the ball mm. and, and fail to sustain the momentum and learn the lessons from how we got to the uh, global downturn, we and repeat the mistakes that mm. got us to where we are now, to where we were just a, f a few months ago. Then we we we, we then um, would have um, failed dismally in our responsibility as the leadership. So we must sustain the momentum for growth. Must sustain the momentum for growth. For country. Inequality, those who are being left behind, and the insensitivity of many of us policymakers and others, to the impact of that on people's lives. That's what keeps me awake at night. Minister. I, I think that uh, the basic challenge for us and for the future is to keep a consistency over time mm. on job inclusion and productivity in the sense that we have to increase the capacity mm. of the country to, to grow and create more and better jobs. That's the secret, and the, the, the critical idea here, the consistency over time, not to have policies come in and out. Mrs. Sintek. Well, uh, specifically for us, 
It's geopolitics moving away from multilateralism, rule-based system to what we seem to be heading. And clearly also, I think uh, it would be terrible if we can't prevent clash of civilizations. Mr. Oshkin, I'll close with you. Uh, quality of life in Russian cities, because you know, in order to be competitive in the 5, 10, 15 years from now, we need to keep top talent in Russia, we need to attract top talent to Russia. So the quality of life is the crucial. Well, we hope that some of the ideas that we talked about here today, collaboration, inclusion, innovation, consistency, predictability of policy, and of course, the tough reform measures that each one of you is hoping to undertake in your own uh, markets do in fact go through and we keep the ball rolling, so to speak, and don't let it drop. Let's hope the momentum continues and the recovery gets only stronger. Thank you very much for joining us here this evening for this panel. Appreciate your time. Thanks very much again. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>